three. Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a wonderful guest today on our show. His name is Harry Hirsch. He is an author, and he's a fabulous mystery writer. And he um, teached for many years at Harvard. And after retirement, he decided to go into mystery writing. He has wrote a beautiful series of mysteries. And he's going to tell you a little about his journey, uh, what motivated him, and the series and the books that that he has, has written. And you're going to find this very interesting, very motivating, and very inspiring. And I'm honored to have you on this show, Harry. This Thank has you. been a pleasure uh, to have you on this show. Can you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Uh, yes, and thank you for having me. Um, um, well, I, um, I grew up in Chicago. I was born in 1952 long time ago, if you can believe that. <laughs> and um, I um, I went to the University of Michigan as an undergraduate. And then I got a PhD in political science at Princeton. So for 40 years after that, I taught political science, uh, first at Harvard, and then at the University of California, San Diego and then at McAllister College in Minnesota. And um, for the last 15 years, I've been here at Oberlin in Ohio. And of course, I did academic scholarly writing um, during those years. Uh, but I'd always loved fiction and I've always been a great reader. And um, I had always thought that when I retired from teaching, I might try my hand at fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, then, uh, as it turned out, my last semester of teaching before retirement was the spring of 2020, which is, of course, when COVID hit. Right. Um, so like everybody, I was on lockdown. And um, all my plans for what I was going to do, like a lot of people went out the window, I was going to move and I was going to travel and do all these things. And um, I needed something to do. Mm -hmm. And um, the origin of the mystery series, it, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, the series is called the Bob and Marcus Mysteries. Bob and Marcus are a gay couple. Mm -hmm. um, Marcus is an academic like me. Mm -hmm. um, and the first novel is called Shade. And um, it's set at Harvard in the 1980s, uh, where I was. And um, back then, when I lived in Boston and I was at Harvard, I had discovered um, a little resort on the coast of Maine, about 90 minutes north of Boston, mm -hmm. called Agunquit, Maine, which is this lovely, quiet town with a beautiful beach. And I would go up there for a couple of weeks every summer. Um, and um, being an academic, what would I do? I would sit on the beach and I would read. Yeah. Uh, and since it was vacation, I would read some books in my field, but I would also read some fiction. Yes. And um, in the summer of 1984, so literally 40 years ago, mm -hmm. I discovered the mystery novels of Amanda Cross. Mm -hmm. um, and Amanda Cross was the pen name of Carolyn Heilbrunn, who was a very distinguished professor of English literature at Columbia in New York, one of the first women to be tenured at Columbia. And she wrote a series of novels, um, and her detective was a professor of literature at Columbia like herself. And um, I loved most of the novels. A lot of them were set in academia. Um, but that summer in 1984, I read a bunch of them. And 
Uh, most of them were great, but there was one that I didn't think was very good. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting on the beach with some friends and I finished this one novel and I sort of slammed it down on the sand and I said, well, we could do better than that. Yeah. I, I just didn't think the plot was very good or suspenseful. So my friends and I are sitting there and we just sort of started brainstorming a plot about a student at Harvard who gets murdered. I was mm -hmm. at Harvard at the time and so were some of my friends. And um, uh, just for fun, I took some notes and I put the notes away. And I went back to my job of being uh, an academic. Mm -hmm. And I didn't look at the notes for decades. And then uh, in the summer of 2020, when we're all on lockdown and I was retired, I looked at the notes for the first time in a long time. And I said, you know, this really might work as mm -hmm. a mystery novel. So I read a bunch of books on how to write fiction, which I had never done before, and a bunch of books on how to write a good mystery. And I started writing and mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And it came together and that became the first novel. And um, I enjoyed it so much that, um, uh, I continued, and so far I've published two more. Um, uh, the second is called Fault Line, which is set in California in the late 80s, um, where I have my protagonists move to California, as I did right. in, in the 80s. And the third one, which just came out, which is also set in California, is called Rain. Um, and um, I found that I've really enjoyed writing fiction and um, um, that's that's where these come from. Yeah, I love it. You know, uh, I like I addressed you earlier, um, I've always had a love for fiction writing, especially with a little mystery in it, a little adventure, you know, it always uh, sparked my interest. Now, what motivated you to now, you said that you had read the book, the, the one of the last books in 1984, and that wasn't that great, and you felt like you could do a better job. Was that the main motivation that really drew you, or was there something else inside you that made you really want to write these series and or just begin yeah. the series? Yeah, well, my my in, in the first novel, Shade, uh, Marcus is an assistant professor at Harvard, as I was. Uh, so there's some of me in Marcus. Yeah. And um, one of his students is murdered. And the student's family, a uh, very well-connected, wealthy family, asks Marcus to look into the student's murder. Mm -hmm. And um, in the course of his investigation, he meets Bob, mm -hmm. who at the time is about to go to law school. And they become a couple. And the first novel is set in the 1980s. The second one is set in the late 80s, 1989. The third one that just came out is set in 1994. The next one, which I'm currently working on, is set a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So part of my motivation was to chronicle the changes in gay life mm. over time. Right. Um, and also to work in uh, political changes over time. Yeah. Um, in the second novel, Fault Line, uh, Marcus and Bob have moved to San Diego, where I lived. Marcus is teaching at the University of California there, as I did. Bob mm -hmm. becomes an assistant district attorney in San Diego. And he is thrust into the investigation of the murder of the mayor's spouse, the San Diego mm. mayor's spouse. Um, and um, since my field is politics, 
-hmm. And I taught uh, courses that were law related, constitutional law, American right. thought. Um, the novels gave me not only a chance to comment about gay life and how it changes over time, but also yeah. to use my knowledge of the law and of politics mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's different than the way I used it in scholarly writing. Right. Um, uh, when you write fiction, you can you can give a lot of opinions. Yes. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can make uh, comments uh, mm -hmm. about political parties or political developments in a way that you can't really in in scholarly writing. Right. Um, so that was part of the motivation. Um, uh, uh, and and I'd say the third factor was um, uh, to be able to comment on academic life. Mm hmm university life, academic life, in a way that, again, you can't really do in scholarly writing. Right. So since Marcus is a professor and he continues as a professor in, in different environments, mm -hmm. um, that gave me a chance to to comment on, on what universities are like. Yes. Um, in the first one, it's what the Ivy League is like and what those those pressures are like. In the second one, it's a large state university and what's what that's like and 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 so on. Um, so there were multiple uh, things that drew me to to writing fiction. Um, but I'd say the biggest factor is that it's fun. It's yeah. it, it's just really fun to use your imagination and and invent characters and and uh, put them in 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 difficult or dangerous situations and uh, see how they deal with it and um, um, to solve a murder. Yeah. And and the great thing about murder mysteries is that um, uh, you, you have your, the basic structure of the plot is clear. Yeah. Who did it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, um, um, at base, every murder mystery is about that. Yes. Um, um, so you have a structure um, yeah. to go into. Now, did you, um, with these with these series, did you leave like a little bit of a cliffhanger or did you kind of make each series its own story? Yeah, each one can stand on its own and, and um, be read on its own. But I also left clues Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes characters who go from one to another. Um, um, so for example, in the second one, there is a police detective uh, that gets involved in the investigation. And by the third one, he's become a private investigator okay. and he becomes a more important character. So um, um, I have left clues um, from from one to the next. And I've also... One of the nice things about having characters who, Bob and Marcus, the main characters, is that I can comment on their relationship mm -hmm. and how it how how they get together, which happens in the first one, right? Um, and how they develop as a couple and how they change as people, um, because people do change over time. Yes, they do. Um, uh, so there's both continuity um, and and change from from one to one novel to the other. Now, you also mentioned that you, you know, one of the focuses was um, emphasizing certain uh, issues of how um, gay relationships have changed over the course of the years and how the political um, uh, life of our, our country has changed as well. Like, what have you noticed from your own opinion of the changes that have occurred from the moment when you started the books to now in the current book book that you have written? Um, yeah, th that's a really interesting and, and, and complex question. Um, um, the first one is set in 1985, which is, of mm -hmm. course, the height of the AIDS crisis. Right. So that is very much um, on the minds of Bob and Marcus as they become a couple. Right. And they develop a relationship. Yes. 
Um, and um, uh, part of what the first one is about is the stiffness of the Ivy League mm -hmm. um, and the not entirely acceptance of yes. gay faculty members mm -hmm. in the 1980s um, in the Ivy League. I think it has changed considerably since then. But since I experienced that, and I know other gay faculty members experienced that, it was something that I wanted to write about. Um, so as time has gone on, Marcus has found academic life to open up in terms mm -hmm. of acceptance. Um, and um, in terms of the um, uh, politics of the era, um, I gave Bob a brother, an older brother in Los Angeles, who mm -hmm. is very involved in Democratic Party politics. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that gave me a chance to talk about the changes in the Democratic Party over time, which right. were profound. And, yeah. and you know, Bill Clinton and 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 Hillary in the in the nineteen nineties really did mm -hmm. reorient the Democratic Party. Right. Uh, so uh, following my characters over time gave me a chance to to talk about that. Yes. And then, uh, uh, the the third novel is set in the early nineteen nineties when the Republican Party is is ascendant. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so it gave me a chance to sort of comment on changes in national politics over time, 80s, yes. 90s, the next one coming in, in the first decade of the 21st century. Right. Um, it was certainly part of my motivation in, in wanting to do a series was chronicling not just the changes in gay life or the mm -hmm. life of a gay couple, but but changes in, in the country um, yes. um, over time. Have you felt that um, with today's society, our current political society, how people view the gay life and they, they view politics in general, have you seen an improvement or do you feel that, uh, that we're um, still stigmatized and we're still stuck in, in, with a lot of um, thoughts that are kind of hindering and, and hurting people? as a whole in our country? Well, th there's no question that there's been a sea change over time in terms of the acceptance of LGBT folks. No question. There has been increasing acceptance. 70% um, um, of Americans now say they endorse gay and lesbian marriage. I mean, mm -hmm. that would have been unthinkable. Right. In, in say in the 1980s yes. at, the, at the height of the AIDS crisis. So there <laughs> has been enormous change, no question. And I've noticed that among my students. Yes. Um, uh, uh, here at Oberlin, I've had a lot of gay, lesbian, transgendered students. And um, uh, for a lot of them coming to this kind of accepting environment, this mm -hmm. is the first time that they've been in that kind of environment, that kind of environment. And I can see how they change as people and how yeah. important it is to be in a, in a nurturing environment. Oh, At the same time, um, I think there are park, uh, pockets of resistance. Mm -hmm. And you certainly see that in the transgendered backlash in the Republican Party today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as, as somebody said, today, transgendered people are like communists were in the 1950s. They are the enemy. Mm -hmm. And for, for some reason, the Republican Party has decided that this is a winning issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think it is. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe there are places in the country where it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they have decided to put their eggs in that basket, at least for the time, for the time being. So I think things have changed 
dramatically. Um, uh, but there are still issues and there are still LGBT people who get beaten up mm -hmm. and murdered mm -hmm. and, and discriminated against and lose their jobs. Yeah. Or LGBT teenagers who get kicked out of their homes and yeah. end up on the street. Um, there is still discrimination in courts over custody. Mm -hmm. um, if one of the partners is gay or lesbian or transgender, yeah. uh, not everywhere, not in every state, not in every court, but it still, it still happens. Um, one of the courses I taught uh, was called Gender, Sexuality, and the Law. Mm -hmm. And we, we would read a lot of those cases. And my students were often dumbfounded mm -hmm. at how discriminatory courts could be yeah. against a gay parent, a lesbian parent, a transgendered parent. Mm -hmm. uh, it was eye-opening for them, but it was also important for them, I think, to 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 be familiar with oh, that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I feel like, you know, there might be two aspects to this where one, what people don't understand or don't know, they fear. And two, the environment they grew up with. If you psychologically look at it from a psychological point, if you grow up in an environment, your parents teach you a certain way of thinking, a certain way of doing things. The church. This, the church. I was just going to say that you're, this is your religion. This is the way you're supposed to act. This is the way you're supposed to do things. And subconsciously, people don't want to let their parents down. They want acceptance and love from their parents. Even if their parents are gone in the back of their head, subconsciously, they feel that they need to honor the, the, the environment that they grew up in, the way they were taught. This is the way it's supposed to be. And then it cycles, just like dysfunctionalism cycles, it snowballs. So then they go into their generation with these, these ideas of the environment they grew up in. And even though it may not be the right environment, it may not be the right choices, it's, be, it's the way they were taught and they psychologically don't want to disappoint the people that they love prior in their relationship. And I think those two things are might be two important factors. What is your intake? What do you feel in, with those two statements? Um, I mean, I agree. I think. I think. Um, uh, I mean, when I was growing up, um, every religious establishment condemned mm -hmm. homosexuality. It mm -hmm. was defined as mental illness. Mm -hmm until in this country until 1973. Wow. By 1973, I was almost finished with college. Right. So, so I grew up um, in an environment where, and it was also against the law, of course. Yes. In, in every state of the union. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I grew up in an environment where there was just no space available, mm -hmm. political space, cultural space. Uh, to be gay. Right. But it started to change because people came forward. Yes. Uh, a very courageous generation came forward. Yes. And fought back. And that's a, that's a story that's been well told now. Yeah. Um, uh, and all of the research, all of the social scientific research shows that what most changes people's attitude is knowing a gay person, knowing a lesbian, knowing someone who is transgendered, seeing yes. that they are a person, mm -hmm. um, that they're capable of doing a job, yeah. um, that they're not sick, they're not criminals, they're not crazy, they're just people yes. who, who happen to have a different orientation to mm -hmm. their sexuality or their gender. Yes. And, and all of the research supports the idea that people have to come out because that's the only way things change. And they have. They yes. have for a lot of people, but not, not, not everyone. No. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, I, 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 today, I think because the Republican Party has decided that 
the evangelical church is its voting voting base. Mm -hmm. They are stuck uh, in the 1950s. Yes. For example, the things J.D. Vance has been saying about, you know, people who don't have children or, or yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane. Yes. Um, um, but clearly it has resonance with some voters. Yes. Or he wouldn't be saying it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I feel in some areas of our country, we have went, we went backwards, but then in other areas we have gone forward. And I think over time, like I had mentioned to you, I think they will be huge changes, you know, as the new generation starts to populate and their thoughts start to evolve and they start teaching their children, we will see a huge change in our country. But right now we are stuck where there are some areas, you know, in our country where people are still thinking, like you said, the 1950s, they are going back and, and they are, you know, looking back at certain things a certain way. And, you know, if you, if you, you know, like, it, I'm not going to get into the religious part aspect of it, but, you know, you know, it, there is nowhere to be found that in the Bible that they condemn, they condemn, you know, gay, being gay or, or being transgendered, you know, and this has been going on for thousands of years, but, you know, we cannot change the minds of the people. They have to change their own minds. And until you look, you walk into other people's shoes, you really shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't judge. And in the Bible, in the Bible, it tells you not to judge you and, you know, so let's not judge individuals. Let's look at ourselves and take care of who we are what, and do what makes us happy. But let's not push our beliefs on other people, you know, is, is, you know, how I feel. Right. I agree completely. Now, I just want to, you know, to get off the subject a little bit, you were telling me that you have a new book coming out that you are working on right now. You're in the process of working on a, a new book for the series. The next book in the series, um, uh, which is called Winter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm just finishing it and that will be out the first of next year. So okay. Beginning of 2025. Um, and uh, it's still Bob and Marcus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a little bit later. Yeah. Um, uh, it's the early two thousands. Okay. And um, uh for the first time, they're hitting some bumps as a as a couple. Mm -hmm. um, they get over the bumps, but but uh, it happens. Yep. And um, uh, as I, as I think I mentioned, I, there there are sort of minor characters that I've been able to bring forward. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, in the first one in Rain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bob has a young nephew uh, who lives in Los Angeles. Right. And by the fourth one, the one that's coming out next year, the nephew is now a college student, mm -hmm. um, uh, and he becomes part of part of the part of the story. So oh, wow. um, that's one of the um, one of the the joys, really, of of writing a series is that you can you can carry characters forward, see how they change. Uh, people get older as they do. Yeah. <laughs> Happens to all of us. <laughs> um, uh, you know, life changes in various ways. Uh, so for example, uh, in the second one, uh, Bob is an assistant teacher's attorney. Mm -hmm. in the third one, he's in private practice. Uh, in the fourth one, he'll he'll still be in private practice. Um, um, there are changes in Marcus's uh, career. So so uh, there are changes. Although I've written, as I say, I've written each one that that I think it can stand on its own as a as a as a murder mystery. Right. You know, for people who um, there are so many people out there that want to write a book, whether it be a mystery or whether it be a nonfiction book, but for you, 
you know, it could, writing a book could be very difficult, but there could be ways where you could break it down to make the process easier and less stressful. For people who really would love to write a book, especially a mystery book or a series of books, do you have some advice for them on how they could begin and how to make the process a little less stressful? Um, well, um, as I mentioned, I read a bunch of books on, on, how to write and how to write fiction and how to write mysteries. And there's some very good ones out there. So if you go to your, your, your local bookstore and, and to the, it would be in the how to section, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really good ones. Um, there is a book um, with a great title called naked drunk and writing. <laughs> Um, and if somebody wants to start writing, I, that I would be, make that one of the first books I read. And um, there's also a book um, about, um, it's about memoir writing. And I, I had written um, a book about a memoir about my academic life called Office Hours, which came out mm -hmm. in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um and there's a book uh, by Vivian Gornick called The Situation and the Story, which is about how to write a memoir. But I think it's also very useful for anybody who wants to write fiction. Right. And it's it's very short and it's very accessible. Um, so I would I would recommend those two books. Uh, there's a lot of of others like them. Um, Anne Lamott has written a bunch of books on, on how to write. Um, um, uh, and um, as, as, as I mentioned, when we were talking before we started taping, um, you know, the books about how to write fiction, all the advice often comes down to one central idea, which is Establish your writing time five or six days a week. Get your butt in the chair and keep your fingers moving. <laughs> Just write it. Yes. Just start writing. And you may end up throwing away pages and pages and pages. Right. But if you trust the process. And if you really sit down and do it, even if you're staring at a blank screen for an mm -hmm. hour, yes, um, sooner or later, you will come up with a sentence or a paragraph or a character yes. an idea that works and that tells you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And it really does work. Yeah. Uh, in fiction, you have to trust the process of writing. It's very different than scholarly writing. Mm -hmm. Scholarly writing, the work happens before you sit down to write, mostly. Right. Mm -hmm. The work is reading the literature, gathering information, gathering data, whatever your data might be, right. doing an outline. Then you sit down to write it up. And the writing is important, but it's not the most important thing. Right. With fiction, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can start with an outline. You may want an outline as you go along, but the work is in the sitting down and just doing it. Yeah. Um, and there are certain conventions in mystery writing. Yeah. Um, there's a famous uh, uh, saying uh, about uh, Chekhov's gun, Anton Chekhov, the great Russian playwright. Mm -hmm. Oops. Who's, and he was talking about playwriting, but the same thing applies to mysteries. Right. And he said, if a gun appears in, in act one, it has to go off by the end of act three. Mm -hmm. So th there's certain sort of rules for the road like that, that, that yes. you'll pick up um, as you go along and as, as you read the books about, about how to do it. Um, and the other thing is... Um, don't be afraid to show a draft to to people whose opinion you respect. Right. Um, I, I get feedback about about your work as you go along. Uh, maybe when yeah. you have 
you have half of the novel written or 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 whatever um you know find people who do a lot of reading and ask them to take a look at it and mostly people are very happy to do that yeah um um there are also a lot of writing courses online you can take if if mm -hmm. if if you feel like you need that kind of structure the the Iowa writing workshop university of yeah. Iowa writing workshop um very well known gives a lot of workshops um, some of them are on weekends, some of them are week long during the summer, some of them are online. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of resources out there. Right. Uh, once you, once you start looking, um, uh, but the most important thing is just sit down and write. Yeah. Um, and it sounds, it's, it may sound stupid, but, but no. it, it, it actually is very profound, you know, yes. if you, just sit down every day and write. Right. It'll it'll come. Mm -hmm. Characters will come. Situations will come. Ideas will come. Images will come. And and they will carry you along. I love it. I love that's great advice. That's great advice. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you wanted to summarize it and maybe give some important factors of the conversation we had today, what are some things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners today? Read my books. <laughs> <laughs> Read my books, you'll love them. Um, um, actually, to, to be, I mean, of course I want people to, read. every writer wants people to. Yeah, read them, oh, 100%. But... Um, um, one thing I'd say is that, um, uh, even though the, the, my detectives, my main characters are a gay couple, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've written them in a way that, um, I hope is interesting to any reader, right? whether they're, they're gay or not. Mm -hmm. Um, um, there's not a lot of graphic sex. Mm -hmm. okay. People don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit here and there. Um, a little uh, spice. But I've really tried to make them them ap appealing to to any reader, certainly any any mystery reader. Right. Um, um, there is a Facebook page um, for the Bob and Marcus Mysteries you can go to. Um, I also have a, a, a website. It's HN Hirsch. H N H I R S C H dot info. And that uh, lists the books. They're available at Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. They are available in Kindle editions. Um, um, so I really hope some of your listeners will, will uh, give them a chance. Well, they sound phenomenal. And I'm definitely going to be one of your readers. Thank they you. sound amazing. And now, where can people contact you if they want to find out more about you, more about the books? Where can people go? On on my website, hnhirsch.info, there's information about me. Uh, they can also sign up for uh, my mailing list. Mm -hmm. And um, I will uh, send them new information as books, uh, new books in the series come out so far i've been publishing about one a year which is i think um um how it will go and mm -hmm. um as i say the fourth one will be out uh beginning of 2025 sometime in the late winter or spring mm -hmm. um, and i hope to keep going um um and um uh i hope people will will give them a chance they sound wonderful. It's been a, amazing to talk to you. I I love the 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 stories. I love the plots behind the stories. I love how, you know, what motivated you to write the stories and, you know, and how you continue to, you know, make goals to set new ideas for, you know, a continuation of the series. And also the advice you gave was phenomenal. I love, you know, there's so many people out there that want to write a book but they don't know where to begin or they're afraid to, or they don't know what it involves. And, you know, you've actually made it very clear that it's not as difficult as it sounds. It's time consuming. It takes thought 
and it takes, you know, energy, but you it, can do it. It, 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 you have to have a devoted re writing time. Yes. Now it's not going to be every day for two years. You know, it might be, you work on it for three months. Right. And then you put it aside and then you come back to it for another yes. month. And then you, you, you know, um, as the saying goes, writing is revising. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, Anne Lamott says every first draft is shitty. Yes. You know, you, you know, you have to, but you have, but you just have to get it down on the page. Yeah. Then you can go back to it and fix it. Right. Exactly. Um, um, uh, but you, but the, the most of the, the, the best advice I can give to people who want to do it is just trust yourself. Yes. Trust yourself to do it. That's excellent advice. That's excellent advice. This has been amazing. You know, I thank you so much, Harry, for coming thank on the you. show. This has been an amazing experience. I hope you'll come back on the show and we can continue Love our conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much. And thank you. Thanks to your listeners. Well, you have a great day. Thank you. You too.